good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much, Jessica, for that uh, introduction. Um, John O'Mahony from Deloitte Access Economics. Uh, been there for about seven years and spent half my time working with Australia's large digital companies, uh, Google, Facebook, Telstra, etc., looking at how digital changes are affecting businesses and, uh, and workforces. The other half of my time done economic reports on the value of Australia's major cultural institutions. Our libraries, the State Library of New South Wales, uh, university sector, uh, state records offices and cultural institutions more broadly. Um, it's a pleasure today to combine both of those passions in this report. Copyright in the digital age uh, to be launched here at, at the conference, no better venue, no better venue for it. Um, it tries to put together some of the economic evidence about a flexible exceptions approach to copyright in Australia. Represents about 12 months worth of work. It's about 70 pages, plenty of footnotes in there. I think there's about 200. Um, and it's my uh, pleasure today not to talk through all of that detail, but just present you with some of the key findings and perhaps answer any questions that you might have. The context for the report is, of course, um, already outlined by the department what's happening to copyright reform in Australia. Um, obviously, on the right-hand side there, you see some of the more technical processes that are being gone through to update Australia's approach to copyright. On the left-hand side, we think a broader opportunity to achieve reform. And I'd say as an economist that copyright changes, particularly the flexible exceptions approach to copyright, is not just a technical change to how copyright works, but it's a genuine economic reform. It's about productivity, it's about competition, it's about red tape reduction. It's the sort of agenda that belongs as much on the Treasurer's desk or on the Minister for Innovation's desk as it does on the Minister for Communication's desk. And looking at all the changes that are happening in the digital economy, I'd recognise that there isn't exactly you know, a wish list of 10 or 20 policies which can change to make Australia more of a hub for digital activity. But copyright reform is there. It's one of the few levers that can be pulled that can drive genuine change. If ever there was a case for standing on the shoulders of giants, I know that's a concept that's been, that's been used um, a fair bit today um, already in different formats. Writing reports about copyright reform is absolutely a case of standing on the shoulders of giants. And we recognise that um, while it's fresh and launched today, there have been many reports, obviously, on the subject already. Um, just some of the recent ones you'll be familiar with, the Australian Law Reform Commission's recommendation for a flexible exceptions approach to copyright, the Department Commission report, um, a, a very high quality report by Ernst & Young recommending a shift to flexible exceptions approach to copyright. I think what that report did really well was demonstrate the challenges in quantifying the impact of how copyright reform works. I do a lot of economic modelling, you know, do scores of economic modelling um, projects every year, um, and I can tell you that um, the tools of economic modelling are not so precise as to be able to identify whether something like the difference between a fair dealing approach or a fair use approach to copyright is going to have an impact on productivity and economic growth. And therefore, a different approach is required to try to see what the impact is likely to be. Most recently, of course, the Productivity Commission, which I think provided a great addition to the debate, particularly in just contesting some of the claims that are part of the copyright reform debate in Australia. We're the little blue country down the bottom, um, obviously, and we're taking a look at it, but, it's, but international experience here, I think, is also pretty illustrative. While the fair use principle has been around in the United States for a long period of time, we've also seen it introduced in other countries, in Israel, in Singapore, in Korea, and other countries that are looking at copyright have gender to generally shifted towards more flexible approach in the UK and Canada. Our friends over the ditch in New Zealand just cracked open a copyright reform process themselves there as well. What's covered in our report? How can we say something new, something different, something that's, that's meant to um, add to the debate? An independent economic report based on a review of experiences and literature to provide case studies, we spoke to the universities, Australia, Melbourne University, New South Wales State Library, Alexander Street Press, Google, Ifbook Australia and the New South Wales Data Analytics Centre to provide practical examples, many which of course were added to in the previous session about what could be possible under a more flexible approach to copyright. 
and we tried to fill th gaps rather than rehearse the arguments so well known about copyright. An explanation of copyright concepts and systems, of course, ex uh, examples of innovative activities, and an independent examination of the issues, coming to the conclusion that a flexible exceptions approach would better support innovation, some transition costs, but would be a system that was more supportive uh, and more responsive over time. We had five key findings in our report. The first one of which is one that reflects um, a, a novice coming to the subject of copyright reform and what it means to people. Looking through the literature at first blush, you'd think that fair dealing and fair use were incredibly different systems. Fair dealing is from Mars, fair use is, is from Venus. But once you dig a bit further into how they, into how they operate, you note that while the, um, while the context around them might be different, they're actually shifting towards or trying to achieve the same objective. And we think that's a very important finding for potentially taking some of the heat out of the debate. <coughs> Copyright, not an absolute right, and forever have had, have had exceptions that allow for socially beneficial additional uses of, of copyright work to be allowed if it's better for society. And they're just different ways of doing it. In 1968, we can sit down and try to write down all of the specific exceptions for education, research, for, for, um, for, for news production and other items and say, well, this is an allowable use of a copyright work without seeking permission and other things are an infringement. And by contrast, the fair use system says, well, we'll have a set of principles around that, which is to say, you can reuse a piece of work without seeking permission, provided that it doesn't materially affect the original copyright um, holder and depending on um, the nature of, of what you've used and how much of it is that you're using. Um, I mean, in some sense, the systems you know, needn't be, except for, uh, the, except for a few exceptions I'll mention later, um, the systems needn't achieve different results. If the world was static and things don't change, I mean, we should be able to just come up with a big list of exceptions that should allow a lot of these socially beneficial activities. Of course, um, you know, as, the, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as Sam from the department mentioned earlier, the Copyright Act is, of course, showing its age. And it's very difficult to polish it up over time through the legislative process, which is just simply too complicated to keep up to date with what's changing in the digital economy. And that's why a flexible or a principles-based approach is a better um, outcome for Australia. The second finding is that there are new innovative uses of material which will be more likely under a more flexible approach to, uh, to exceptions to copyright. And for that reason, it can help drive Australia's digital economy. Now, we've produced a forecast of the value of the digital economy. It's about $79 billion at the moment out of, a out of an economy that's worth about $1.5 We forecast that's going to grow to $140 billion by 2020. A lot of that activity is going to be underpinned by new innovative uses, and some of them are going to depend upon um, reusing copyright material. Um, Deloitte puts out regular publications about um, technology, media and telecommunications trends. And a lot of them have at their core some combination of information reuse, data text mining, machine learning, artificial intelligence. They're collectively known amongst the tech crowd as being exponential technologies. I mean, it's a bit of a, a highfalutin phrase and probably mathematically <laughs> incorrect because I, I doubt all of their take-ups are going to go up um, exactly by the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the mathematical equation. But they're called that because they're expected to go from a fairly nascent level of take-up to a very high level of take-up uh, in a very short period of time. And according to the technology forecasters, that time is now. And that's why uh, today I'll give you five or six examples of how these technologies are being used. But at this conference in a couple of years' time, I'm going to give you a stack more. Um, five years ago, I wouldn't have been able to give you any examples of, what, of some of these new innovative uses. The search engine itself is an example that relies um, upon a fair use uh, system of copyright exceptions. I have to take a copy of each website and index them so that I can create a search engine. And that's why a company like Google is able to create a search engine in a fair use jurisdiction like the United States and not in Australia. The iPod, for different reasons, 
a, uh, a device that in part depends upon a fair use approach to, to copyright. Um, you'll remember originally, um, before, before digital music, that uh, it, was, it was ripping CDs from one format to another onto your computer that helped the economics of iPods stack up so that people didn't have to repurchase all of their music. Again, something un less likely um, in Australia. The latest new one, of course, is text and data mining not trying to steal people's copyright, but just trying to reuse material for a purpose that was probably unforeseen by the original copyright holder. Obviously, for some dedicated data sources, there are licences that can be purchased, but for many, for many, there aren't. We spoke to the Data Analytics Centre, a unit inside the New South Wales government, which is trying to combine different data so sets so that it can come up with more innovative solutions to government problems, and concern there that some of those are not going to be covered legally. Cloud computing, the government's um, cloud computing policy has identified the legal, pardon the pun, but it just comes up every time, the legal cloud that, um, that some of that activity depends upon because people have to copy material in order to, to store it in the cloud, copyright material, uh, and also machine learning, that is using more information to come up with answers. This is something that's going to be a lot more prevalent in the next couple of years. And I'll just give you one example of that. It's the, the Google Translate product, which of course goes around the internet using an algorithm and tries to compare different texts and translations and come up with the best way of translating words and sentences into something new. Now, if you are the rights holder to one of millions upon millions upon millions of translations that's being temporarily used to inform this algorithm, it's pretty hard to argue that that was an original use of your copyright material or is a genuine revenue opportunity in the digital age. Um, and these sort of what are called non-expressive uses of material um, are, are obviously something that um, would be beneficial for Australia's digital economy without really uh, impeding, on those, impeding on those traditional rights. The second job we had was to go through some of the evidence around traditional rights holding industries and see if we could find evidence for them being unfairly harmed by a fair use approach to, to, um, to, to copyright exceptions. Um, it was hard to find. Fair use does not have as its aim undermining copyright and it has a safeguard built into its principles about not interfering with the commercial rights of a rights holder that should stop that. All else we can do is look at countries that have fair use or that have become more flexible and see if we can find this evidence of collapsing creative industries, um, uh, 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 publishers closing um, and other changes being wrought by fair use of material that's been put out and we were not able to find it. It's not to say that those sectors haven't undergone tremendous change because of digital uh, technology change more generally, business model change or ongoing problems with piracy, and they're issues that um, we've obviously got a great amount of empathy for, but I think somehow the fair use change has become caught up in those other broader changes that are happening, um, and that that's, um, that's, uh, that's, led to some, that's led to some false claims. We've seen um, thriving creative sectors in, in fair use jurisdictions. The third one, I think, was actually adequately covered by um, the, uh, the session which we just had, Roxanne, Julia, Delia, talking us through the many other benefits of a more flexible approach to copyright for education and information access. For universities, academics' ability to reuse material is obviously of great educational benefit and uh, if something is of a, of, a, of, a, of a marginal nature, were it able to be put up publicly um, online, it could be of benefit to students, were it available through a massive open online course, there would be an opportunity for the university to expand its education offerings without um, it all having to be, all of the you know, information be stripped out because of copyright um, issues. Also, you know, those, those low value issues as well, uh, low value reuses of material, I know Roxanne spoke about some of that, and some of the administrative processes that are there at the moment for universities. The same is true for, the same is true for libraries. Spoke to one state librarian as part of doing this project. Um, some things uh, that are infringements of copyright were being done anyway just because they were of, they were of good, socially beneficial use, um, but it would be better if they were under a, um, a, more, a stronger legal framework. And finally, for schools to improve collaboration um, in the use of information. And the final fifth finding we had was to understand the, the legal change that Australia would need to go through to shift from a fair dealing system to a, to a flexible exceptions approach to, um, to copyright exceptions. I think we recognise in the report 
like there have been in other sectors where there's been change, there could be some short-term uncertainty or costs that are associated with a legal update. However, like in other areas, guidance from the government, explanatory memorandum and other fora, industry codes, other things, would be able to help minimise what those costs might be. Secondly, looking at the end point of what a legal system would look like under a more flexible exceptions approach where you'd be at least notionally more reliant upon courts to, to, um, to drive legal change and to provide guidance, we did not find a significant increase in legal activity in fair use jurisdictions. In the United States, you know, uh, uh, fair use cases under copyright law are not common. There might, there's less than one a month and the vast majority of them are sorted out by what's called summary judgment, which just means that the, that the, uh, the judge looks at um, uh, the, the material, looks at the original work, makes a decision, and most of the time those summary judgments are upheld. So I don't think um, that there was evidence of a lawyer's picnic or a huge um, you know, legal, and, uh, and, 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 um, legal and copyright industry that would be built up were Australia to move to the new system. So we find that it will be more responsive over time and I think that's the reason why we think the flexible exceptions approach is a good idea. That a, a short term way of addressing some of the challenges that have been mentioned on the panel or some of the challenges that I've outlined with the current copyright system in Australia is you could just add more exceptions to that list. And that would be a, a reasonable short term fix. But over time there will be new uses and new exceptions that can't be foreseen that potentially you know, could be allowable under a more flexible approach. And you know, it's probably a bit of a hackneyed example that I'm sure everybody in the room is familiar with, but I'll mention it, um, I'll mention it anyway. And that's, and that's the time shifting, um, the time shifting exception that's been added to Australia's um, uh, uh, fair dealing system over time. Whereas in the United States, copying um, the, the, uh, a television program onto a, onto a video cassette tape using a VCR was something that was cleared up in 1984 as being an acceptable, acceptable use of material. Took Australia a healthy 22 years before that was able to be put into statute. Obviously, I don't know where your VCR was in 2006. Um, mine had a fair, bit of, a fair bit of dust collecting on it under, in, the, uh, in the storage room underneath, underneath the stairs. Um, so uh, if that's the responsiveness of, um, of, of Australia's legal reform processes, you'd have to think that now might be the chance to uh, move to a principles-based approach, um, drive economic reform, and give the Australian economy a little bit more flexibility. Um, myself and my colleagues, um, uh, I, I acknowledge Lucy, Taylor, uh, and Ben, who've also contributed a lot to the report, also to Professor uh, Henry Ergas, who I'm sure will be uh, known to many of you in the audience as well, was a key contributor to our report. He is, um, he's in New York today, um, so we'll have to Skype him if you want to ask him some questions, but the rest of us will be uh, tucking into a sandwich in, um, in five or ten minutes upstairs. So if there are any extra questions about it or, or, or feedback about the, the research, we'd love to hear it because while, um, while our conclusion is that a shift to a flexible exceptions approach is a good idea, um, at the same time, it's not the sort of thing that we would be, we'd consider ourselves ideological about as well. And if there were other bits of research that would help inform the debate, well, obviously, you know, we'd love to, to take a squiz at them. You've been very generous um, with your time in, in what, in, with what I imagine are some grumbling stomachs. So I'll hand back to, to Jessica. She might invite, you know, maybe one or two kind of polite questions, but then after that, we'll let you go. Oh, in polite questions. No, I need the polite ones. Uh, is anybody keen to ask John any questions? Specific. Uh, well, specific questions perhaps can go up to lunch um, and be done over sandwiches. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. This was actually one of the most useful things I think I can see coming out of the report is just having it all in one spot. Yeah. All this stuff that's being talked about. So thank you very much. Lovely. And, yeah, thank really you.